the repairer of reputations. Toward the end of the year 1920, the government of the United States had practically completed the program adopted during the last months of President Winthorpe's administration. The country was apparently tranquil. Everyone knows how the tariff and labour questions were settled. The war with Germany, incident on that country's seizure of the Samoan Islands, had left no visible scars upon the Republic, and the temporary occupation of Norfolk by the invading army had been forgotten in the joy over repeated naval victories, and the subsequent ridiculous plight of General von Gartenlob's forces in the state of New Jersey. The Cuban and Hawaiian investments had paid 100%, and the territory of Samoa was well worth its cost as a coaling station. The country was in a superb state of defence. Every coast city had been well supplied with land fortifications. The army, under the parental eye of the general staff, organised according to the Prussian system, had been increased to 300,000 men, with a territorial reserve of a million, and six magnificent squadrons of cruisers and battleships patrolled the six stations of the navigable seas, leaving a steam reserve amply fitted to control home waters. The gentlemen from the West had at last been constrained to acknowledge that a college for the training of diplomats was as necessary as law schools are for the training of barristers. Consequently, we were no longer represented abroad by incompetent patriots. The nation was prosperous. Chicago, for a moment paralyzed after a second great fire, had risen from its ruins, white and imperial, and more beautiful than the white city which had been built for its plaything in 1893. Everywhere, good architecture was replacing bad, and even in New York, a sudden craving for decency had swept away a great portion of the existing horrors. Streets had been widened, properly paved and lighted, trees had been planted, squares laid out, elevated structures demolished, and underground roads built to replace them. The new government buildings and barracks were fine bits of architecture, and the long system of stone keys which completely surrounded the island had been turned into parks, which proved a godsend to the population. The subsiding of the state theatre and state opera brought its own reward. The United States National Academy of Design was much like European institutions of the same kind. Nobody envied the Secretary of Fine Arts, either his cabinet position or his portfolio. The Secretary of Forestry and Game Preservation had a much easier time, thanks to the new system of National Mounted Police. We had profited well by the latest treaties with France and England, the exclusion of foreign-born Jews as a measure of self-preservation, the settlement of the new independent Negro state of Suani, the checking of immigration, the new laws concerning naturalization, and the gradual centralization of power in the executive all contributed to national calm and prosperity. When the government solved the Indian problem, and squadrons of Indian cavalry scouts in native costume were substituted for the pitiable organizations tacked on the tail of skeletonized regiments by a formal secretary of war, the nation drew a long sigh of relief. When, after the colossal Congress of Religions, bigotry and intolerance were laid in their graves, and kindness and charity began to draw warring sects together, many thought the millennium had arrived at least in the new world, which, after all, is a world by itself. But self-preservation is the first law, and the United States had to look on in helpless sorrow as Germany, Italy, Spain and Belgium writhed in the throes of anarchy, while Russia, watching from the Caucasus, stooped and bound them one by one. In the city of New York, the summer of 1899, was signalized by the dismantling of the elevated railroads. The summer of 1900 will live in the memories of New York people for many a cycle. The Dodge statue was removed in that year. In the following winter began that agitation for the repeal of the laws prohibiting suicide, 
which bore its final fruit in the month of April 1920, when the first government lethal chamber was opened on Washington Square. I had walked down that day from Dr. Archer's house on Madison Avenue, where I had been as a mere formality. Ever since that fall from my horse four years before, I had been troubled at times with pains in the back of my head and neck. But now, for months, they had been absent, and the doctor sent me away that day, saying there was nothing more to be cured in me. It was hardly worth his fee to be told that. I knew it myself. Still, I did not grudge him the money. What I had minded was the mistake which he made at first, when they picked me up from the pavement where I lay unconscious, and somebody had mercifully sent a bullet through my horse's head, I was carried to Dr. Archer, and he, pronouncing my brain affected, placed me in his private asylum, where I was obliged to endure treatment for insanity. At last he decided I was well, and I, knowing that my mind had always been as sound as his, if not sounder, paid my tuition, as he jokingly called it, and left. I told him, smiling, that I would get even with him for his mistake, and he laughed heartily and asked me to call once in a while. I did so, hoping for a chance to even up accounts, but he gave me none, and I told him I would wait. The fall from my horse had fortunately left no evil results. On the contrary, it had changed my whole character for the better. From a lazy young man about town, I had become active, energetic, temperate, and above all, oh, above all else, ambitious. There was only one thing which troubled me. I laughed at my own uneasiness, and yet it troubled me. During my convalescence, I had bought and read for the first time The King in Yellow. I remember, after finishing the first act, that it occurred to me that I had better stop. I started up and flung the book into the fireplace. The volume struck the barred grate and fell open on the heart in the firelight. If I had not caught a glimpse of the opening words in the second act, I should never have finished it. But as I stooped to pick it up, my eyes became riveted to the open page, and with a cry of terror, or perhaps it was of joy so poignant that I suffered in every nerve, I snatched the thing out of the coals and crept shaking to my bedroom, where I read it and re-read it, and wept and laughed and trembled, with a horror which at times assails me yet. This is the thing that troubles me, for I cannot forget Carcosa, where black stars hang in the heavens, where the shadows of men's thoughts lengthen in the afternoon, when the twin suns sink into the lake of Halley, and my mind will bear forever the memory of the pallid mask. I pray God will curse the writer, as the writer has cursed the world with this beautiful, stupendous creation, terrible in its simplicity, irresistible in its truth, a world which now trembles before the king in yellow. When the French government seized the translated copies which had just arrived in Paris, London, of course, became eager to read it. It is well known how the book spread like an infectious disease from city to city, from continent to continent, barred out here, confiscated there, denounced by press and pulpit, censured even by the most advanced of literary anarchists, no definite principles had been violated in those wicked pages, no doctrine promulgated, no convictions outraged. It could not be judged by any known standard. Yet, although it was acknowledged that the supreme note of art had been struck in the King of Yellow, all felt that human nature could not bear the strain, nor thrive on words in which the essence of purest poison lurked. The very banality and innocence of the first act only allowed the blow to fall afterward, and with more awful effect. It was, I remember, the 13th day of April, 1920, that the first government lethal chamber was established on the south side of Washington Square, between Wooster Street and South Fifth Avenue, the block which had formerly consisted of a lot of shabby old buildings, used as cafes and restaurants for foreigners, had been acquired by the government in the winter of 1898. The French and Italian cafes and restaurants were torn down, 
the whole block was enclosed by a gilded iron railing and converted into a lovely garden with lawns, flowers and fountains. In the centre of the garden stood a small white building, se severely classical in architecture and surrounded by thickets of flowers. Six iconic columns supported the roof and the single door was of bronze. A splendid marble group of the fates stood before the door, the work of a young American sculptor, Boris Yavain, who had died in Paris when only 23 years old. The inauguration ceremonies were in progress as I crossed University Place and entered the square. I threaded my way through the silent throng of spectators, but was stopped at Fort Street by a cordon of police. A regiment of United States Lancers were drawn up in a hollow square around the lethal chamber. On a raised tribune facing Washington's Park stood the Governor of New York, and behind him were grouped the Mayor of New York and Brooklyn, the Inspector General of Police, the Commandant of the State Troops, Co Colonel Livingston, military aide to the President of the United States, General Blunt, commanding at Governor's Island, Major General Hamilton, commanding the gar garrison of New York and Brooklyn, Admiral Buffby of the fleet in the North River, Surgeon General Lansford, the staff of the National Free Hospital, Senators Wise and Franklin of New York, and the Commissioner of Public Works. The Tribune was surrounded by a squadron of hussars of the National Guard. The governor was finishing his reply to the short speech of the Surgeon General. I heard him say, The laws prohibiting suicide and providing punishment for any attempt at self-destruction have been repealed. The government has seen fit to acknowledge the right of man to end an existence which may have become intolerable to him, through physical suffering or mental despair. It is believed that the community will be benefited by the removal of such people from their midst. Since the passage of this law, the number of suicides in the United States has not increased. Now that the government has determined to establish a lethal chamber in every city, town and village in the country, it remains to be seen whether or not that class of human creatures from whose desponding ranks new victims of self-destruction fall daily will accept the relief just thus provided. He paused and turned to the white lethal chamber. The silence in the street was absolute. There, a painless death awaits him who can no longer bear the sorrows of this life. If death is welcome, let him seek it there. Then, quickly turning to the military aid of the president's household, he said, I declare the lethal chamber open. And again, facing the vast crowd, he cried in a clear voice, Citizens of New York and of the United States of America, through me the government declares the lethal chamber to be open. The solemn hush was broken by a sharp cry of command. The squadron of hussars filed after the governor's carriage. The lancers wheeled and formed along Fifth Avenue to wait for the commandant of the garrison, and the mounted police followed them. I left the crowd to gape and stare at the white marble death chamber, and crossing South Fifth Avenue, walked along the western side of that thoroughfare to Ble Bleacher Street. Then I turned to the right and stopped before a dingy shop which bore the sign, Hauberk Armorer. I glanced in at the doorway and saw Hauberk busy in his little shop at the end of the hall. He looked up and catching sight of me, cried in his deep, hearty voice, Come in, Mr. Castigain. Constance, his daughter, rose to meet me as I crossed the threshold, and held out her pretty hand. But I saw the blush of disappointment on her cheeks, and I knew that it was another Castigain she had expected, my cousin Louis. I smiled at her confusion, and complimented her on the banner she was embroidering from a coloured plate. Old Hauberk, sat riveting the worn greaves of some ancient suit of armour, and the ting, ting, ting of his little hammer sounded pleasantly in the quaint shop. Presently he dropped the hammer and fussed about for a moment with a tiny wrench. The soft clash of the mail sent a thrill of pleasure through me.
I love to hear the music of steel brushing against steel, the mellow shock of the mallet on thigh pieces and the jingle of chain armour. That was the only reason I went to see Hauberk. He had never interested me personally, nor did Constance, except for the fact of her being in love with Louis. This did occupy my attention and sometimes even kept me awake at night, but I knew in my heart that all would come right and that I should arrange their future as I expected to arrange that of my kind doctor, John Archer. However, I should never have troubled myself about visiting them just then had it not been, as I say, that the music of the tinkling hammer had for me this strong fascination. I would sit for hours, listening and listening, and when a stray sunbeam st struck the inlaid steel, the sensation it gave me was almost too keen to endure. My eyes would become fixed, dilating with a pleasure that stretched every nerve almost to breaking, until some movement of the old armourer cut off the ray of sunlight. Then, still thrilling secretly, I leaned back and listened again to the sound of the polishing rag, swish, swish, rubbing rust from the rivets. Constance worked with the embroidery over her knees, now and then pausing to examine more closely the pattern in the coloured plate from the Metropolitan Museum. "'Who is this for?' I asked. Hauberk explained that, in addition to the treasures of armour in the Metropolitan Museum, of which he had been appointed armourer, he had also had charge of several collections belonging to rich amateurs. This was the missing greave of a famous suit, which a client of his had traced to a little shop in Paris on the Quai d'Orsay, he, Hauberk, had negotiated for and secured the grieve, and now the suit was complete. He laid down his hammer and read me the history of the suit, traced since 1450 from owner to owner, until it was acquired by Thomas Stainbridge. When his superb collection was sold, this client of Hauberk's brought the suit, and since then the search for the missing grieve had been pushed until it was almost by accident, located in Paris. Did you continue the search so persistently without any certainty of the grieve being still in existence? I demanded. Of course, he replied coolly. Then for the first time I took a personal interest in Hauberk. It was worth something to you? I ventured. No, he replied laughing. My pleasure in finding it was my reward. "'Have you no ambition to be rich?' I asked, smiling. "'My one ambition is to be the best armourer in the world,' he answered gravely. Constance asked me if I had seen the ceremonies at the lethal chamber. She herself had noticed cavalry passing up Broadway that morning and had wished to see the inauguration, but her father wanted the banner finished, and she stayed at his request. "'Did you see your cousin?' Mr. Castgain, there, she asked, with the slightest tremor of her soft eyelashes. No, I replied carelessly. Louis's regiment is manoeuvring out in Westchester County. I rose and picked my hat and cane. Are you going upstairs to see the lunatic again? laughed to hold Hauberk. If Hauberk knew how I loathed that word lunatic, he would never use it in my presence. It rouses certain feelings within me, which I do not care to explain. However, I answered him quietly, I think I shall drop in and see Mr. Wilde for a moment or two. Poor fellow, said Constance, with a shake of the head. It must be hard to live alone year after year, poor, crippled, and almost demented. It's very good of you, Mr. Castigain, to visit him as often as you do. I think he is vicious, observed Hauberk, beginning again with his hammer. I listened to the golden tinkle on the grieve plates. When he had finished, I replied, No, he is not vicious, nor is he in the least demented. His mind is a wonder chamber, from which he can extract treasures that you and I would give years of our life to acquire. Hauberk laughed. I continued a little impatiently. He knows history, as no one else could know it. Nothing, however trivial, escapes his search, and his memory is so absolute, so precise in details, that were it known in New York that such a man existed, the people could not honour him enough. Nonsense, 
muttered Hauberk, searching on the floor for a fallen rivet. Is it nonsense? I asked, managing to suppress what I felt. Is it nonsense when he says that the tacits and cuissards of the enameled suit of armour commonly known as the princes emblazoned can be found among a mass of rusty theatrical properties, broken stoves and rag picker's refuse in a garret in Pell Street? Hauberk's hammer fell to the ground, but he picked it up and asked with a great deal of calm how I knew that the tacits and left cuissard were missing from the prince's emblazoned. I did not know until Mr. Wilde mentioned it to me the other day. He said they were in the garret of 998 Pell Street. Nonsense, he cried, but I noticed his hand trembling under his leather apron. Is this nonsense too? I asked pleasantly. Is it nonsense when Mr. Wilde continually speaks of you as the Marquis of Avonshire and of Miss Constance? I did not finish, for Constance had started to her feet with terror written on every feature. Hauberk looked at me and slowly smoothed his leathern apron. That is impossible, he observed. Mr. Wilde may know a great many things. About armour, for instance, and the prince's emblazoned? I interposed, smiling. Yes, he continued slowly, about armour also. Maybe, but he is wrong in regard to the Marquis of Avonshire, who, as you know, killed his wife's traducer years ago and went to Australia, where he did not survive his wife. Mr. Wilde is wrong, murmured Constance. Her lips were blanched, but her voice was sweet and calm. Let us agree.